All right, so field instrumentation for consolidation monitoring. Now, um, a lot of the time in geotechnical engineering, we would really like to make measurements to verify that our calculations uh, are working and that they're valid. Um, but our clients often don't want to pay for those measurements, right? So convincing them to pay for it can be a real challenge. Uh, consolidation monitoring is one of those areas where convincing them to pay for testing might actually really be in their best interest. It could save them a lot of money on uh, the schedule and time is money. So if they can get the project done early, that's great. So say for example, we need to build something on really soft compressible soil. We'll often monitor it to uh, look at how the consolidation is progressing. Um, and the main reasons why we would monitor it are that we don't really know ahead of time uh, the drainage path length, right? We know the layer thickness based on boring logs and so forth. But, you know, when you drill into a site, you get hit a layer of clay. Well, then there's a little layer of sand in there. And then you drill over here and you, and you drill down and there's clay and there's maybe some sand layers, but they're at different elevations. You don't know if they're hydraulically connected. Okay, if you have sand layers that are horizontally continuous and can convey water, consolidation may go a lot faster because the drainage path length might be, you know, half as big as you think it is or something like that. So that's, that's the first reason why we might want to do monitoring. Consolidation in the field usually goes more quickly than we predict based on our calculations um, on some presumed drainage path length and some C sub V value. All right, the second one here is perhaps more um, important. We're often waiting for pore pressure to dissipate. So we apply some loading condition and we're waiting for the pore pressure to dissipate because as pore pressures dissipate, the soil is becoming denser, water is being expelled from the void space, and denser soil is stronger. So the soil is getting stronger as it consolidates. So for example, a lot of the time if we have to build a roadway embankment or um, a, a rail embankment or something over soft clay layer. We can't build the whole thing all at once because it would just sink into the ground and cause a bearing capacity failure. So we have to build one layer, let it consolidate for a while, the soil becomes stronger, then we can add a second lift and it'll consolidate more. Right, so the key question that we have to answer in this problem is whether the settlement that we're observing is due to consolidation or is it due to shearing? So Consolidation, you can imagine we build, you know, we build this embankment here on top of some kind of soft compressible layer. Consolidation would be caused by water being squeezed out of the layer, and it would not be caused so much by shear deformation where the soil is just kind of getting, you know, extruded sideways out from underneath the uh, bottom of the embankment. Um, and that's compared with more of a shear kind of deformation. Here you have the embankment and there's a circular slip surface and a crack through the embankment and now there could be settlement of the embankment but clay is getting pushed out horizontally from underneath right and that's what we want to avoid so that's the critical question that we need to put instruments in to decide now the reason why instrumentation makes sense here is you know let's say that we only could place half of this embankment and we want the full elevation to be up there eventually well, we place half of it. We wait for consolidation to happen. We're just sitting there waiting, right? The, con the contractors would like to get out there, place more fill. All we're doing is waiting for water to leave the clay before we can do that. So uh, if the water happens to leave the clay faster than we initially predicted it would, we can push the project schedule. And as I mentioned, um, consolidation almost always happens more quickly in the field than we predict. Right, so right up there you can see it's gonna go, it's almost invariably it will go faster than you predict. So monitoring it could really allow you to push the schedule. So let's talk about some of the instrumentation that people use. Uh, one common one is the settlement plate or the settlement rod, which you can see the text right there. Um, this consists of a plate that gets put generally at the bottom of the embankment. And that plate is tied to a, oftentimes a threaded rod or some kind of a steel rod that goes up. So you can just, you know, put some bolts on the bottom so that the rod is connected to the casing. I mean, to the, to the settlement plate. Now we don't want the soil in direct contact with the rod because we want the plate to move down and we don't want a bunch of friction along that rod influencing its deformation. 
So often what we'll do is put a casing around it, and that might be like a piece of PVC pipe. So you have a rod going down the middle of a piece of PVC pipe that's connected to a plate at the bottom. As the plate settles, the PVC kind of stays where it is, and you can, you can then come in with a survey crew and look at the elevation of the top of that rod as a function of time and figure out the settlement rate. Okay, that's kind of an old-fashioned way. There are um, other ways of, of doing that now where the surveying is more automatic, um, but, you know, the idea is the same. We're just measuring settlement of the um, bottom of the embankment. Uh, okay, as we mentioned before, the settlement itself is not enough for us to know whether we're getting consolidation, which is water being squeezed out, or whether we're actually squeezing clay solids out of there due to shear. So we need extra instrumentation for that. And right here, we have some piezometers. Those are pore pressure measuring transducers. So that's a way for us to know how much water pressure there is in the soil. And usually we'll put them at different elevations so that we can track this within the uh, clay layer. Um, the piezometers can be sort of analog where you have to go out and measure water levels. I'll talk in more detail about what piezometers are and how they're configured. Uh, but more commonly, they're digital instruments. And so there's some sort of an output, like a voltage signal, that gets recorded at the surface using a data acquisition system. Uh, a lot of these data acquisition systems, or DAC as they're abbreviated, um, will have a modem built in, so you don't even have to go to the site to get the data. It just sends it to you automatically, pretty slick, right? So you can stay in the office and monitor your consolidation and provide input to the construction crew on when they can place more fill. Um, and what we would look for in the piezometers is that, you know, obviously you're going to start seeing settlement happening in the settlement plate as pore pressure is dissipating first from the top and maybe the bottom of the layer if it's double drained. But we want to see um, pore pressure start to dissipate in the middle, right? That's, that's where pore pressures dissipate last. So it takes the longest for that to start. If the pore pressures haven't started dissipating in the middle, that means that the soil in the middle has not started getting stronger yet. Even though you're seeing quite a bit of settlement, there's no pore pressure of dissipation in the middle. So if you go in and add that you know, second layer of fill for your embankment, you might still get shear failure just because the soil in the middle of the layer is still really soft and weak. So you can think of it as like an Oreo cookie, right? You got the cookie on the top and bottom that are all consolidated, nice, crispy. And then the middle is the, um, the center that's all soft and it could get extruded out. Um, okay, so then the other bit of instrumentation that we like to use a lot is, is an inclinometer. And that's a, a plastic casing, like a PVC casing that gets installed into the ground, generally into a borehole, although you can compact fill around it too. And then the, um, the inclinometer, I, th I think I forgot to draw a little sketch of what the uh, inside of the inclinometer casing would look like. So if we come up here. The inclinometer casing itself is an open pipe like this, and then it has these little plastic guides on the inside, and um, they're oriented across the pipe from each other at 90 degree separation angles. And what you do then is you take your this device called an inclinometer, and it gets lowered down into the pipe, and um, as it's going down the pipe, it's measuring the rotation angle. Right, so if you integrate rotation, you can get displacement. And so you're measuring rotation, measuring rotation, then you have the casing go all the way down into some layer that you know is not really moving, right? And so that's a fixed reference point. So if you integrate from the bottom up, you can get a displacement profile. And the reason we use the inclinometer is to figure out if this thing is moving horizontally, right? If we integrate and we find that the inclinometer casing is going like that, well, maybe we're getting too much shear deformation. We're squeezing clay out and it's pushing on the inclinometer. So ideally, we don't want to see rotation. We just want to see the inclinometer kind of stay vertical like this, but the settlement happening. And that means that we're getting consolidation, not shear deformation. Uh, okay, so inclinometers, settlement plates, those are pretty basic instruments. There actually are in-place inclinometers now where you can put um, a string of MEMS accelerometers into a casing and the MEMS accelerometers measure tilt. And so you can just also hook that up to a data acquisition system. You don't even have to send a technician out to the field to make the measurement. 
you can automatically look at the deformed shape as it as it moves. Use that to uh, help guide your your fill placement schedule. So for piezometers, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about how these sensors are configured. There's three types. The most basic one is the perforated pipe. So uh, in that case, you drill a borehole, you put a pipe in the ground, and water flows into the pipe, and you measure the elevation of that water. Um, it's not as common to use those anymore for consolidation monitoring, although we do use perforated pipe wells quite a bit to monitor groundwater elevation. Uh, the more common ones would be numbers two and three, the electrical resistance strain gauge or the vibrating wire piezometer. So I'll talk about each kind just so you have a better sense for what these are. All right, so the perforated pipe is here, right? I've drawn it in the, in the center of a borehole. Uh, usually the, the pipe is gonna occupy a bigger fraction of the borehole, but I couldn't fit everything in here. So the, it makes it look like the borehole's really big and the pipe is pretty small. In reality, the pipe might be almost the same diameter as the borehole, obviously small enough that it could easily fit inside. All right, now if we just lowered a pipe down, well, first of all, let's say you just have an open borehole and you let it fill up with water. Um, the water level in the borehole is gonna be really a representation of sort of the average pore pressure throughout all of the soil layers as it's consolidating. It's not really what we want, right? We wanna know what's the pore pressure maybe at a specific elevation. So what we wanna do is isolate the piezometer so it's only being influenced by soil at a specific elevation. And the way we do that is to construct um, bentonite layers. Bentonite is a kind of clay, right? Very, very low permeability. Um, the clay minerals are very flat sheets, very thin, high plasticity. So we'll, we'll construct a bentonite layer that basically will seal off hydraulically a certain region in the middle. With, with, so you have bentonite on the top and bottom and then we have this region in the middle that has some sand, and that's where the perforations are in the pipe. All right, so now water can flow in through that sand, but the bentonite plugs are preventing it from you know, being influenced by the clay above and below. So it's more like we're only averaging maybe over a limited depth range, right? The pore pressure region measurement is averaging a small depth range. Uh, okay, and then these perforations are generally bigger than the sand, so we have to wrap the pipe in a geotextile to prevent sand from flowing into the pipe. Then what we would do is wait for water to flow up into the pipe and we would measure the water level right here. And you can do that by lowering a tape measure and listening for when it hits the water, or there are devices now that use electrical current to figure out when it hits the water, it closes and makes a circuit, and it'll beep and tell you that you've reached water level. Um, so again, you have a perforated pipe surrounded by geotextile, perforated part is encased in sand, and then there's bentonite seals above and below the depth of interest. The problem, there are a couple problems. First, a lot of water has to flow in, right? This pipe is big, and the clay consolidates slowly. So in order to get the water level up here, a lot of water has to flow out of the clay and go into this pipe and raise up to the elevation that you're measuring. What that means is that you're not measuring something that's happening very quickly and you're not measuring the current condition very well, right? Um, there's some lag between the pore pressure here and that amount of time it takes for the water to flow in and the water level to actually change. So, you know, you can't make those measurements very quickly. The second problem is you have to send somebody out to the field to generally measure that water level not ideal, right? You'd like to be able to hook up your data acquisition system, have the data beamed back to you in your office, and then you're all set. So the next kind of sensor we'll look at is the electrical resistance strain gauge. Uh, this kind of sensor is fairly commonly used. They tend to be pretty inexpensive. It's easy to get data acquisition systems that can uh, provide the right voltage. You have to provide a current to the signal, to, to the circuit to make it work. Um, and then you get a voltage out. So the way it's configured, you have some housing, which is this thing here. Um, generally, it's some kind of stainless steel, something that's corrosion resistant. Uh, and then there's a porous stone, right? So we wanna get water into the piezometer, but not soil, 
we don't want to measure earth pressure, we want to measure water pressure. That means we have to have a porous stone there to let water through, but keep the uh, soil out. And then the bit that provides the signal is this diaphragm. So there's a little diaphragm right there, and water pushes against that diaphragm, and as the pressure increases, the diaphragm will flex inward like this. Right, I'm exaggerating, it's not gonna flex that far inward, but it will move a little bit. And then we put a strain gauge on the back side of that diaphragm, and when the diaphragm flexes, the strain gauge produces a voltage output that we record and relate to, uh, to water pressure. Um, so there are a couple of benefits for these, right? We can hook them up to a data acquisition system, beam data back to ourselves through the cloud, through a modem. Um, compared to the pipe, there's very little water required to flow in, right? To move that diaphragm a little bit might require only a few drops of water. Still, you have to have water flowing through that porous stone and pushing on the diaphragm. So there's gonna be some phase lag, some time delay between any changes in pore pressure and when you actually measure it using the electrical resistance strain gauge. Um, so we want the diaphragm to be as stiff as possible, right? The, a stiffer diaphragm means less water has to flow through, but then it's harder for the strain gauge to measure strain. So there's a sort of in the sensor design, there's a trade-off there. Um, and then you can, you can record them at fairly high frequency. I've actually recorded piezometers in peat soil at um, sampling frequencies of 200 hertz and you could see dynamic changes in pore pressure you know just by jumping up and down on the ground surface so if it's really well saturated and you have not very much movement required to get a signal you can measure dynamic loads using these the problem is that these sensors do tend to break over time they get susceptible to corrosion and then also there's um, there's air on the back side of the diaphragm if the pressure changes in that air, it will push on the diaphragm and accidentally show up as a change in pore pressure instead. So a lot of the time we vent this to the atmosphere and then we have another sensor at the ground surface to measure atmospheric pressure and we have to make atmospheric pressure corrections. So that can alter readings and you can get this kind of drift over time that is actually atmospheric rather than water pressure. All right, and then the final type of sensor that we'll talk about is a vibrating wire sensor. And um, these ones are configured basically the same way as an electrical resistance strain gauge sensor. You have the housing, you have the uh, diaphragm, but then instead of putting an electrical resistance strain gauge on the diaphragm, there's a wire. Okay, so the wire goes between the diaphragm and the housing and it has some tension in it. So um, I'm a guitar player. I know that the tension and the diameter of a wire and its mass density, when you pluck it, you'll get a certain natural frequency, right? It'll tend to vibrate at a certain frequency. So that's the concept here. It's just like playing a string instrument. So there's a device down here that plucks the wire and measures the frequency of oscillation. And um, if, if the pore pressure increases and the diaphragm flexes, that will cause a reduction in tension in the vibrating wire, right? So the reduction in tension means that the wire will have a natural frequency that's lower. So uh, anyway, there's a device down there that oscillates the wire. There's another device that measures its oscillation frequency, and then that gets mapped to uh, pore pressure. So again, benefits of this kind of sensor are that there's very little water that has to go in to the piezometer to cause the diaphragm to move. Right, so low impedance, I guess, it, it's, or high impedance, it's a way of thinking about it. It doesn't take very much change to uh, make a measurement. So it can be pretty quick. This one is not sensitive to atmospheric pressure, right? Even if the atmospheric pressure back here changes a little bit, the wire, is, well, the diaphragm tends to be stiffer, so the wire will have kind of the same natural frequency. Um, one of the problems is that this one cannot be sampled at as high of a frequency as a strain gauge with um, a strain gauge piezometer. You can imagine there's some time required to pluck that wire and measure its natural frequency, whereas the electrical resistance strain gauge is more of an immediate change that happens. But uh, these are more robust, so they don't tend to break as frequently in the field. So if you want to do long-term monitoring, the vibrating wire piezometer is probably a better bet than the electrical resistance strain gauge.